he owns this business, he uh, wants the staff to respect him, he's the boss. Nobody on staff respects him. They just mock him and criticize him and he has no respect. So what he does is he thinks he can solve this problem. So he goes out and puts a big sign on his office door. I am the boss. He goes out to lunch, comes back in his brand new Rolls Royce, comes walking in and there's a sign on his door and it says this, your wife called, she wants her sign back. Oh, come on. Some of you men should be saying amen. That's so true. Come on. Men, have courage. <laughs> Last week we were talking about touching God or God touching us. And basically I said there's three key areas that have really touched my life. Faith. To have childlike faith, to have perseverance faith, to have a, a faith that is peaceful. Where God can come in and touch me. Second one I went through was openness. Openness by doing worship. Openness by welcoming him in, by seed faith, by watching. Third one I talked about was humility. Being righteous before him. Being able to rest on the word of God so faith can come out of it. And then realizing and recognizing. Three things that we wanted to get across is he knows he loves us and he wants to touch us. He wants to touch your life. But the third one is he is sovereign. Well, the problem I have in God touching me and me touching God is a lot of us don't pray. Now, when I was a, a young kid out in Scarborough, we went to a church out in Scarborough. I won't name the, name the church. And every Sunday, the pastor was a great man. I don't have any problems with him. He was great. I, I have highest respect for him. But he drove me nuts some Sunday because all he would do is stand up and say, you must pray. And he would sweat and scream, you must pray. And he'd pull his tie down and he'd, you must pray. But he never taught us how. And I went down to Bible college in Springfield, Missouri, and I was so embarrassed my second year Bible college when one of my teachers said, you don't even know how to pray. I mean, being raised in a Christian home, that's pretty embarrassing. And he said, I challenge you to go over to Central Church. They're giving a seminar on Saturday on prayer, and all of a sudden my life has changed. Every year we do this for the first 15 minutes and then we do something else in the second. But we do this because the fact is this, I'm incredibly impressed with how many people are starting to learn this because of repetition and they are starting to pray. But I'm also broken how many people know this, but they do not pray. Let me share this with you. When the pastors get to heaven, we are not judged at how many people come to this church. We're not judged at how quality sermons we have. What we're judged on is if you become the Word of God. And the Word of God teaches us praise. So let's start with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. You know it, okay? Lots of people know it. I recommend that you memorize it if you don't. Let's start off with the first one, our Father. Why does Jesus do this? He wants you to get personal. You don't say our God. Shelly doesn't say to me, hey man, she goes, Billy, or she says, sweetheart, or she says, coochie coo, or, or, or when she's ripped, ticked with me, she goes, William St. Richard, you get in the house right now, I want to talk to you. And that's when I go, sprained ankle, can't get in the house, sprained ankle, you know. She, and then you hear her yell, Jesus, heal him, or take him home. Can I ask you something? Isn't it time to get personal with God? I mean, he's family. He's family. The Bible says that we are co-heirs with Jesus Christ and we belong in the family of God. So the first one is to get personal. The second one is our Father, which art in heaven, the place. The place tells the story of the authority. Let me give you an illustration of this. My brother is an American. I am a Canadian. He lives in the United States. I live in Canada. I feel sorry for him. 
But if he gets a letter from the White House, it's big do the White House. Now, if he gets a letter from U.S. junk mail, he throws it out. But when he gets a letter from the White House, if he ever did, he would open it, read it, and show it to everybody, the place. The place. Could you imagine if this was Jesus taught us this prayer, our Father who art in hell? Why would we even pray to you? Our Father, which art in heaven. See, the place tells the authority. Our Father, which art in heaven. Let's go to the next one. Hallowed be thy name. Instead of coming in and start asking what does he do, he turns around and he says, hey, let me give you praise. Hallowed be thy name. And then he goes on with this incredible thing, thy kingdom come. See, see, somebody says, where is the power of God in his kingdom? And why pray for something if you're not first going to acknowledge the power? So what Jesus is doing, he's teaching us one of the elements we should do in prayer, and not only this prayer, but we can say it in our own words. We need your kingdom. What does Matthew 6, say? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Hello. So Jesus starts off with our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That's the potential. By the way, just so you know, I, 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 I was thinking this the other day. When we get to heaven and we find out what he wanted to do in his will versus what he did because we limited him. And I said, God, that's a terrible thing to think, how we've limited you. But here Jesus says, hey, thy will be done. His will is much better. Get, you know, I told you this story. I really like this one girl in Bible college, and the Lord said, no, stay away from her. If she's not my will, just imagine how much better my will will be. And I, I questioned God, because this girl in, in college, she was a dish. But when Shelly came down the aisle on the wedding day, oh, she was a buffet. <laughs> and I heard, I heard the Lord speak to me. He says, I told you so. See, you could have had a dish, but I'm giving you a buffet. Ooh-cha-cha, ooh-cha-cha, ooh-cha-cha. Going to go sit with your wife, aren't you, Pastor Thomas? Eh? All this talk, I, yeah. <laughs> Shanley, just meet him outside, okay? You guys are going home right now. I can tell, okay? <laughs> On earth as it is in heaven, that's the purpose. What is prayer to bring heaven down and touch earth? When you pray to God, what are you praying for? You want God to touch you. You want heaven to come down. Heaven doesn't have sickness. Heaven has the will of God. Heaven has direction. We want that. Now watch this. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, provision. Now bread, he, you can go beyond bread. But notice all the other elements he gives before he gets to asking. And then he goes on, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Purity. And then he goes on and forgive us our debtors as we forgive our de debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Protection. And then he ends with this. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory. Three things, kingdom, power, glory. Whoo! Kingdom comes first because the power comes after the kingdom comes, and then God gets the glory forever, which means for today. Amen. Those are the elements you can build into your prayer life. Now, there's another way of doing this, and it's called the prayer wheel, which I learned. And you start off with praise. You praise God for who he is. You're holy. 
I praise you. Last night when I was walking and praying, I couldn't get past, God, you are so good to me. Father, you, you love me. I praise you for loving me. I could not get past that. I tried to move on to, you know, you're righteous. And all. I just kept coming back to you. I couldn't get past that. And then Thanksgiving, you thank God for what he's done, what he's doing, and what he's going to do. Illustration, the other day I was praying. I, I just, I remembered something that happened cool to me when I was in fifth grade. And I just started thanking him for it. You know, remember Jesus t tells the story about all these guys he healed and only one comes back? to thank him. Thank him for the past. You thank him for the present. But here's the one I love. You thank him for the future. A lady who had cancer uh, a number of years ago taught me this. When she had cancer, she's praying, God, I want to just thank you. I want to thank you for this trial I'm going through for one reason. I know that you're going to take me through it. I know your will's going to be done. I want to thank you for your healing. And all of a sudden, through thanksgiving, she started claiming her miracle. Now, now watch this. You don't come into somebody's house and just sit down and tell them what you want. But when you come into the house, if you're polite, you come in with praise and thanksgiving. Oh, nice house. Thanks for having us over. You don't just walk in and say, hey, what's to eat? Right? But the third one is confession. And listen to me, a lot of you, when you hear confession, you think Catholic, Catholic, Catholic. Well, I hate to tell you this, the Bible teaches that we need to confess our sins to one another. They're not far off. Now, I'm sorry, I cannot forgive you of your sins because I don't have that power, only Jesus can. But the fact is, confession is not only asking God to forgive you of your sins, but also being honest. Illustration. Let's tell the truth. Three out of five men in an evangelical church like ours has problem with pornography. One out of five evangelical ladies have problems with pornography. So it's not just good enough to get in a confession where you just repent, oh, Jesus, forgive me for all the porno I've seen this week. Oh, please, for da, 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 da. But it's also a great time in confession to be honest with them. Lord, I'm in a pickle right now. I don't know what to do. I need you to help me. Show me what to do to get out of this spider web of sin. I'm entangled. So it's not a question of just confessing, Lord, forgive me, but it's also a time to be honest. And then, then the fourth one, which I absolutely love, is meditation. And that's where you put on your Buddhist gown. And you, no. But see, as soon as I say meditation, a lot of you think Far East instead of Middle East. Because if you look at it, it came out of the Middle East. It came out of Old Testament. Meditation is to think on the Lord, to quiet yourself down and to let your mind start to think about God to hang the phone up, stop texting, not turn off the music, and just let your mind think about God. Be still and know that I am God. Oh, the next one I love, because what happens is we go into intercession, and intercession is when you pray for others. Petition is when you pray for yourself. You always pray for others before you pray for yourself so you don't look selfish. And intercession is a powerful thing where we intercede. Let me share this with you. If you're not interceding for the members of your family, you're selfish. Well, you don't know how old I am. I don't care how old you are. There's no rule when you get 25, then you are a prayer warrior. There are prayer warriors in our children's department down there who are seven, eight years of age. They pray like crazy. Bible says to have childlike faith. Intercession, and then you go to petition where you pray for yourself. I don't even need to teach that one. You're all good at that one. After petition, you do waiting upon the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord, he shall renew his strength. Waiting is where the Lord sits down with you, and he just tells you, maybe you should pray for this person. Let me give you an illustration. We just came back from China. Ed comes in my office, Pastor Ed, and he goes, hey, 
When you were in China, all I could pray is, God, don't let him get hit by a truck or a bus or a car. That's all he prayed for. And I broke out laughing. I said, just a sec, I got Shelly on speed dial. And I say, hey, Shelly, Ed wants to tell you what he was praying for. So he said, Shelly, all I could pray for is that he doesn't get hit by a bus, truck, or a car. And she says, well, Ed, thank you so much because he nearly got hit by all of them. <laughs> he was so excited about being in China, he forgot to look both ways. And we were constantly pulling him out of the way of trucks. Only thing he didn't get hit by was an airplane or a train. He nearly got killed by everything else. See, Ed was waiting upon the Lord and he helped me in China. My mother used to do this, drove me nuts crooked. Your mother did this to you too. These mothers who wait upon the Lord and then the Lord says, go talk to your son because he's sinning in this area. And I would come home and there'd be a bowl of ice cream on the table. My mother believed a whole lot of sugar makes the medicine go down. She said, eat your ice cream, I need to talk to you. Jesus told me you're doing this, this, this. And I would go, who told you? She said, Jesus. She says, if you don't smarten up, he's going to tell me what to do with you. <laughs> do you understand the waiting? Now, now watch this, okay? Then you pray the Bible. And I've talked to you about this. Lord, I take Proverbs 3, 5 today, and I believe it. I trust in you with all my heart. Areas I don't, please help me. I lean on your own understanding. In all my ways, I'm going to try to acknowledge you. And now I ask that you would direct my path. John 14, 6 says that you are the way, truth, and life. Be that today. James 1 says to consider pure joy when I face trials. Well, here's my trial today. I don't have a lot of joy. Could you give it to me? But I take James 1, 5 seriously, Jesus, where it says, if I lack wisdom, I can ask of you and you'll give it to me. So I'm claiming that today through the Holy Spirit's power. So we pray the Bible and then we speak in tongues. Now somebody says to me, well, you know, I'm not Pentecostal, so I don't speak in tongues. You don't have to be Pentecostal to speak in tongues. You just have to be a believer. Why, do, why did Jesus send tongues down so we could speak in it? Well, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, it edifies you. He says, when you speak in tongues, it edifies you. I don't know anyone who doesn't need to be edified. And then let me take you to the last part, thanksgiving and praise. Now, I've said all that to show you something that's changed my life. And, and I've talked to you a little bit about it. How did God touch Jesus? Let me give you point number one. Jesus needed to pray. I want God to touch me. Well, do like Jesus. Jesus, in Luke 4, he was led out into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. 40 days, 40 nights, he fasted and prayed, and then the devil came and tempted him three times. How do you fight temptation? How do you fight sin? Jesus says in the Garden of Gethsemane story, pray so you will not fall into temptation. Now, listen to me carefully. The word pray so you will not fall into temptation, what Jesus' translation is this, prayer moves the heart of God and the power of God, and God will help deliver you from temptation, sickness, illness. He will also be able to grant unto you his will. So, so Jesus needed to pray. Number two, Jesus received through prayer. And number three, Jesus conquered because of prayer. Now, there's four things I want to leave with you this morning that I see in Jesus that are absolutely amazing when it comes to prayer. Number one, are you ready? Jesus prayed because he had passion. Jesus prayed because he had passion. Illustration. Lady goes into doctor's office. All of a sudden, doctor says, I'm sorry to tell you this, you have cancer. You won't believe when the lady hears she has cancer how she gets passion to pray. It's always ironic to me how when people get bad news, they become prayer warriors. Why can't we have passion to pray before we get bad news? I mean, do we have to be motivated by bad news in order to do God's will? 
Jesus had passion. But number two, Jesus had priority. I, I, I hear people who say, oh, my day slipped away. I never got time to pray. That's because you haven't made prayer priority. You ate. Food is more priority than prayer. Oh, congratulations. You showered and got dressed this morning. Clothes and, and showering is more priority than prayer. Hello. And then some people say to me, well, you know, God doesn't move in my life. I don't know why God doesn't move in my life. Hey, how's your prayer life? Well, it sucks. Well, then God moving your life sucks too. Why? Because if you look at the men and women of the Bible, Daniel, three times a day. Hey, Daniel, don't do that anymore. We're going to have three in lines then. I don't care. This is priority. Passion, priority. Let me give you a third P Jesus did, perseverance. Disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane fall asleep. Three times Jesus goes back and prays. The Bible says he prayed so hard, the sweat was like drops of blood. Perseverance. Forty days and forty nights he fasted and prayed. Perseverance. Perseverance. Jesus is crowded by thousands of people who want to, him to pray with them and teach them and all this. And what does he say to the disciples? Hey, let's get in the boat. I need to pray. Perseverance. And the last one I give you is power. My, my, I, I didn't understand this when I was taught this in graduate school where one of my teachers said Jesus would have been totally useless here on earth without prayer. And I said, no, he was the son of God. Yes, he was human, but he was son of God. And then my professor said, well, why did he pray then if he didn't need to? Well, to give us an example. Oh, come on, give me a break, Billy. He prayed a lot without people around. And if you look at the life of Jesus, Jesus prayed and prayed and prayed in order to do the will, the will, the will of the Father. I want to teach the business people in the auditorium this morning a lesson. Green Mango Restaurant is just over on Bloor Street. I forget the address, 3006 or something, Bloor Street West. It's a phenomenal Thai restaurant. People go to our church. They're great people. They get, sent me this shirt. I lost some weight, so it looks really big on me. I'm sure Shelly will steal it later for something else. These people are godly people. We have a lot of business people in the church who are godly people. All the t-shirts I get from now on, they want me to wear. I'm not going to, but don't worry. But I love this because they build Jesus into their business. Let me give you an illustration. See the green mango t-shirt? Look at the back. Lord, please let there be foe in heaven. <laughs> Is that great? Of course, for the people in Green Mango, you don't understand. There will be foe in heaven, okay? And for those of you who are too white, you don't understand. Foe is a, 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 a Thai noodle soup dish, which... <laughs> what? Vietnamese? Okay, Viet I knew some of you would yell that out. I knew that. And then somebody would write Mandarin and Thai. Okay, give me a break. It just, you know what? It's not really Vietnamese. It's heavenly. If I was rewriting the Bible, I would say man cannot live by foe alone. Okay, so. Why do I use green mango as an illustration this morning? Not to promote the restaurant. It's always full. When was the last time you built prayer into your business or your career? Now, I'm not saying pray during working hours and rob your employer of that money. But when was the last time you went to work 15 minutes before you were supposed to start or half an hour before you started and you didn't make a big scene? I have a friend who started a new job a number of years ago and before he went to work, well, before anybody else got to work, he was there at his desk and he just took a little drop of anointing oil and he just touched 
the site of his desk, and he said, in the name of Jesus, this is where I'm going to work. I anoint this desk with oil. And I pray that the power of the Holy Spirit will use me in this job. I end with this illustration. I think one of the successes of the Green Mango Restaurant is the Holy Spirit. I think one of the successes of Christians in the future is when we don't only just pray for our family, but we incorporate prayer for our entire career and ministry. I, I'm so, uh, Olaf is here this morning with Tracy, his wife. Olaf is an a international painter. He paints beautiful paintings, beautiful, beautiful paintings. And if you see his paintings, uh, well, when I see his paintings, I see the glory of God in them. The Queen's Plate uh, is, uh, has him in a competition up at the Queen's Plate at Woodbine Racetrack where his paintings are going up against others and you can go online and, and so forth to vote. I'm not promoting Olaf. But the fact is this, that success. You say to me, yeah, well, if you knew the kind of job I was in, you would pray just to get out of it. Well, see, with that kind of attitude, your day's going to really suck. But when you go in with the attitude of Jesus, Jesus, could you make my day good at work? Could you help me bless my boss? Could you, Lord, just touch me? But Lord, I not only touch me, but you know that guy who's, who's swearing his head off beside me and he smells really bad and he just hates his wife. Could you just, Lord, somehow let me be a blessing to him? And maybe halfway through when you go for a coffee, the Lord will say, buy a popsicle for him. Lord, I can't stand him. It doesn't matter. And you give the guy a popsicle and all of a sudden you made his day. You never said anything. You never preached. But you were motivated because of prayer. Why do I use business as an illustration? See, a lot of us, we pray for our families and we pray for ourselves and we pray for missionaries. And thank God you pray for the church and you pray for me. I, I'm so humbled. But you've got to incorporate prayer in every area of your life. I have a friend who used to be a carpenter. He said every time he bought a tool, and he had hundreds of tools, he would pray that God would keep him safe with that tool and that he could use it properly for the glory of God. He did great work. I mean, when was the last time you bought a used car or a brand new car? We only buy used cars. But when you bought a car and you just went out with some cooking oil and you just put a little dab anywhere on the car and you just prayed, Lord, bless this car so nobody gets an act, but also, Lord, use it for your glory. See, incorporating prayer. Incorporating prayer. I'll tell you how far I've gone on this. We moved into this house where I don't understand. Every toilet in the house decided to break on me. And I hate toilets. And, and, and I, don't, I don't want plumbers to come in and do it. I think I should do it. And so the last toilet I put in, Joe, I'm not kidding. I'm down on my knee putting that stupid toilet in. And this is like the fourth or fifth toilet I put in this house. And well, my boys have helped me on other toilets. You know what I did? I just knelt at the toilet said, Lord, could you make this the last toilet I've ever put in? <laughs> now, I don't know if that's going to happen. Probably not. But do you understand what I'm saying? When you're faithful in the small things in prayer, he will bless you even with the big things. The elements of prayer. Our Father, the prayer wheel. See, when I stand before heaven, it's not that I preached a good sermon, but I took a group of 2,000 people and helped disciple them to be prayer warriors.